uh, we're here in the lab and we're going to talk about spinal cord stimulation in 20 minutes. And I'm actually going to be talking about two uh, different types of therapies. Right now, we have seven, seven spinal cord stimulator systems on the market, and soon to be eight come this fall, uh, pending FDA approval and everything else. So you have a lot of options in front of you. And, and as you know, it's really important you learn the bells and whistles of each system. Uh, I've been fortunate over the past 10, 11 years to kind of work with all different companies. And honestly, you know, you, I have great outcomes basically with every single one of them. There's one that's not on the market any longer that, you know, I just didn't and I'm glad they're off the market. Um, but here I'm going to be talking about the Boston Scientific System uh, primarily. And that's what I'm going to showcase and demonstrate for you live, uh, which was actually one of the first companies I really got involved with out of fellowship. Uh, and then I'm also going to just briefly talk about the Medtronic uh, systems as well, because Medtronic was really the first in the United States to commercialize. And you know, when I was a fellow 10 years ago, um, I sort of felt like they were the, the old grandfather of spinal cord simulator companies. But they've really revolutionized in the last few years to pick up some new waveforms uh, and have the smallest IPG in the market. So we'll talk about the bells and whistles as I demonstrate. But since I don't have much time, I'm going to get going here. And this is always fun at Seattle Science Foundation. You get a cadaver and you just see what happens. But in general, guys, as you know, we always prepare. We always prepare for these cases. We look at the imaging. We understand the epidural space, the anatomy, the degree of scoliosis before. Um, and then in the pre-op area, uh, just speaking only about the procedure itself, we always mark out where the IPG location would be based on the patient's comfort. So one of the things I do is I have my patients put a dental floss box uh, in their lower uh, back region or the upper buttock region to see what it's like from their day to day, how it's like to sit in a car, what it's like to sleep, if they're a side sleeper or a back sleeper or whatever else. Um, so for this particular patient, I've just arbitrarily put down an IPG template. Uh, and if we have the camera above, you can see I have this template here. And I try to standardize this as much as possible. So for me, um, whenever I do my trials, I, I come in from the right side. And whenever I do my implants, I come in from the left side. Now, you might think that's kind of strange. But the, what I, why I developed that over, over time is that I, you, know, you do create a little bit of scar tissue when you do these procedures. So to come in back through the same track once in a while can be a little bit uh, harrowing. So when I've changed to the standardization of doing one on one side and the other on the other side, I haven't had these issues ever since. Um, and I also make my incisions uh, generally four centimeters always. Uh, so I've got my two anchors that I can put into that four centimeter incision for the anchor site up top, and then four centimeters for the IPG, of course. Um, and there are different types of IPGs, different sizes, but for this particular system, uh, that's what we have here. So looking at the fluoros, you guys can appreciate we have a very nice interlaminar space, although there's quite a bit of spondylosis. The 12-1 interlaminar space looks very, very good. Uh, so what we'll do here um, is we'll just mark out a point. Uh, and John, if we can just go just slightly north so they can appreciate the 12th rib coming in. I don't think they can see that in their, uh, on their screens. Yeah, just a little bit there. Um, so they, there you can all appreciate uh, the 12th rib. Perfect. So... Let's see here. So I'm going to come in a little bit lower here. I'm actually going to come in at the 1-2 space just because uh, that looks good there. And then I'll enter in the 12-1 space. So this is just in my incision point. So what you can see here is I've gone down a vertebral body and a half to the inferior aspect of that pedicle. Uh, and then if you can see on the camera view up top, I've gone down about four centimeters. So what you can do is grab a ruler uh, and look here. And then what I like to do is make sure that this line is, is right in line with that, uh, the medial aspect of the pedicle. So John, if you can come back down, you can see just a, like a smidge, like a little bump. Perfect. You can see right there my, my radiopaque marker. So that's right in line with the medial aspect of the pedicle. So I know that this incision is going to be in line with the pedicles and the spinous processes. So we'll go ahead and make an incision. I don't have electrocautery, of course. I generally use an 11. We'll use this 10 here. Oh, we'll make it. And what I like to do is just in these, especially for cadavers, just really finger dissect, feel down, feel all my anatomical structures, feel the spinous processes. Perfect. Feel the articular pillars. Great. And so I have a nice plane here. So before I put my needles in or do anything else, what I like to do is I like to finger dissect a plane. The reason I do that is because I want to lay down this tension relief loop, which is eventually going to go in. And what you don't want to have is a patient that's moving around that tension relief loop stands up and starts poking through the incision. So by creating this plane, I'm making a nice uh, layer for the loop to sit in. And then I'll eventually get to the IPG site, but I'm already thinking about how this is all gonna to lie in place. So then what I'll do is we'll go back up, John, just a little bit here, and I'll just lay in my chewing needle into the, 
to incision, and we'll collimate a little bit, go up a little bit further, John, if you don't mind. And so you can see I'm just crawling up to that lamina, and we'll just do a little bit of more caudal tilt on the II. Perfect, just to line up the end plate, even though 12-1 looks a little, there we go, just a little bit. There we go, it sharp, sharpens it up. And so right now, guys, I can feel that I'm on lamina, so I can feel the bone here, um, and I know I'm not you know, digging the spinous process. So now the, the beauty of the, the chewy needle is that it's scalloped on the back. So I can basically glide or surf off the lamina. And this is one of the points where I would generally put some local anesthetic. So I'm right, as you can see, at the tip of the lamina. And that's a good point for me to grab my LOR syringe. I like my trajectory heading up towards that 12 spinous process. So we'll just enter there. I'm really shallow, which is nice. And there we go, we get a loss there. And hopefully if I've, beautiful, if I've gone the trajectory that we've liked, then we'll see everything we want to see. And you can see basically it's parallel to the triangle of the spinous process. And then what we have here that's unique to Boston Scientific is an Infineon lead, 16 electrodes, um, unique in the industry. What's really nice about it, it gives you a lot of uh, distance to program. Uh, when it first came out, I believe, 11, 12, I can't remember the exact year, but it was a really cool thing to have in our space. And we'll just take this up. Again, we don't know this patient's uh, particular pain generators, uh, but we'll just assume uh, leg and low back pain. We'll aim for the, the T8, 9 regions, just depending. And we can do some programming as well, of course, intra-op. And we'll just head north, John, please, if you don't mind. Keep coming up with me. Thank you, sir. Beautiful. And this is a little dance. So what I'm doing here is little jabs and going left, right, left, right. And you can see the slight degree of scoliosis here. Uh, perfect. So this will probably be my left. And let's do a little bit more caudal on the II here, John, so we can just see the end plates line up a little bit better. Beautiful. And then I'll bring this up again. And I'll have this guy be the right side lead. So I'll take it here. And it doesn't have to be perfect with the first lead because what I'm going to do now, come back down, John, is now I'm going to take the second needle. And one of the things that I, you know, when I was a fellow, the way they trained me was, okay, put one needle there and then one needle, you know, on, over here on the right side. Okay. Well, now I had to make two incisions and I started thinking, why the hell would I do that? I want to be as minimally invasive as possible. Why do I have to enter the, the interlaminar epidural space from two different sides? So um, about a year into practice, I started doing uh, two needles from the same side. And what I always do now is Basically, I have my depth gauge to get to the epidural space from the first needle. So I just, if you can see from the top camera, uh, basically bring my needles parallel to each other, and I just follow. I just feel and make sure that they're perfectly parallel. And before I get to the exact same depth, I just take a look. As you can see, they're you know, side by side. And I look at you know, where we are, and you can literally just get down to the level of the patient and look and see, okay, well, I have a little bit more to go, so I'm gonna do that. But before I get to the epidural space, in case I'm off by just a little bit. I get my LOR syringe, and then I just take it home. And you should see that loss right about the same level. Mm. We'll see that there. I'll just test with the lead. That loss was a little so-so, but we'll just take a look. Another technique you can perform besides LOR to air is loss of loss of the lead itself. And if you see the lead come out, yeah, there's a little schmutz there, and that might be the other, there we go. That actually might be the other lead I'm feeling. So let me do this. So what I might be uh, coming up against is the other lead on resistance, because I was so close. So I'm just gonna turn the bevel just a little bit, and there we go. And now I'm up and running. So I'll grab that steering, pop it on the top. And now, because I have that first lead in there, and then John, we can head towards the north, please. Thank you. I can now just basically run along this lead. So let's say, yeah, as you can see here, now this lead's choosing to go on the right side. That's totally fine. I can go to the left side. But let's just say it's going up the right. I can always move my other lead and make that adjustment. So I can say, all right, well, that was my right lead. Well, I want this to be more left-sided. Okay, great. Well, now I can take this back. So you can always just let the anatomy you know, do what it wants to do, tell you what it wants, 
and then just take that up the right side. So we've got a nice, you know, flared position. Uh, this is generally what I like because if the patient starts moving and you have these flared epidural leads and, the, and it kind of is a little up and down, it will, re it will stay relatively in the same position. Whereas if they're perfectly parallel, the patient starts moving, it may go up and down a little bit more easily. So a little flare creates a little bit of tension relief. And so once all that looks good, and I'm happy with the position, we've tested the patient, and they're like, yeah, you're nailing my back and my legs. Thank you so much, doc. I feel it, feels great. We take our stylets out. <clears throat> and if you're worried at all, gee, you know, did they move at all? Like that one moved a little bit. You can always use stylet in advance or pull down because you have so much room here with the Infineon lead. You can always do things with the needles out. Pull there, stylet pop everything off, beautiful. And you see what happened when the stylet was pulled out, and that's totally normal, natural, and then you can make the adjustment there. Now what we'll do is the anchor sites, so big deep breath, great, everything looks good. We can check a lateral, uh, John, to just make sure everything looks golden here as far as being in the epidural space. And while that happens, uh, what I do is like to spray a little irrigation on the leads, reduce the, the, the resistance, and make sure that we get the anchors on here. And these are really cool anchors in the industry. These are called click anchors. I've loved these from day one. They're still some of my favorite anchors. Um, and they basically use a Torx screw or wrench to, to bring it down. And, it, and, and quite frankly, when I started as a fellow, I wasn't, I wasn't super great with you know, anchoring sutures, et cetera. Uh, but I learned to be over time. Go ahead and take a shot there, John, when you have a chance. We'll raise up a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, but these anchors help me uh, become more confident. And so you can see here the, the two leads are in the posterior epidural space, which looks great. Um, obviously, sometimes you see a little sagging in these cadavers because the CSF turgor and pressure is, is reduced, of course, but uh, the, everything looks great. And, and you can see the, the entire lead system is in that posterior epidural space. You don't see anything coming off to the side or uh, heading anterior where it can really rub the rootlets, uh, and that's what can cause some discomfort for patients. So we can come back around. And then what I would do is I generally use 2 uh, at the bond, uh, suture these down times two, uh, Torx wrench down. Now I'm going to focus on the IPG site, which I've already highlighted uh, and templated from the pre-op area. And as I mentioned, four centimeter incisions for everything. So what I do is if you look uh, at this, I don't know if you can zoom in, guys. Do you want me to use the overhead camera maybe? Perfect. Yes, yeah, CRM can move out. So if you just even look at the, the interface between the header and the metal, it's four centimeters, okay? So I didn't just make up that number out of the thin blue. Um, it's four centimeters, and that's exactly where I want my incision to be, is right in the interface. That's just a, a personal trick of mine. So I always use a ruler, I try to be precise. As I mentioned, four centimeters, I've got this template. I don't usually use I-band, but for this cadaver, we have it for smell purposes. And now on size, so again, you know, after doing local anesthetic, 27 gauge, then followed by a 22 gauge, I then incise deep, so we have a 10 blade going across, four centimeters. Uh, generally use Bovi uh, for hemostasis. But again, I, get, I need to get below scarpas, I need to feel around, uh, and, and the depth here is about two centimeters. So with these rechargeable systems, uh, two centimeters is ideal because they have to interface with the charger. If you have a non-rechargeable system, which we actually have here, you can go deeper because you don't have to recharge these systems. So you can go to you know, depths of four centimeters if you wanted to. Um, the caveat being they're just a little bit larger, but they last for years. And the rechargeable, you, you recharge every week or, or two, depending on the energy burden. So we get down, and usually I'll use a METS here, but because this is fairly simple with cadaver tissue, um, I can finger dissect, and I feel up and down, and I actually make sure I can start to feel uh, towards my site, and then with the template, not necessarily with the IPG itself, I'll just make sure it fits in just fine, and it does. So then I'll grab the tunneling tool, and this is again after I've sutured everything down here. Uh, I'll feel that plane. So I've got my finger in that plane that I had created early on, and I start feeling. So I, I make sure my point doesn't hit my finger, that that would be a faux pas. Could not be my friend anymore, like Doug said. And then you really want to make sure you're in a plane where there is fat. You do not want to go through muscle. You do not want to be too superficial to skin. That's what really irritates people. People always watch me, and they're like, how do you put that huge instrument in people and they don't even move? My anesthesiologist will ask me. Because as long as you find the right plane, 
This should not be super uncomfortable. Uh, if you have a really skinny patient, that's not always easy, especially if you're doing cervical spinal cord stimulation, you're traveling all the way from their scapula all the way down. Sure, there can be issues there. Uh, but in general, as long as you find that fat plane, this should run very smoothly and easily. So I'm just finding that plane, and it does. And I've got a good trajectory. And you can already see here that through the skin, it's poking through. And so we'll unscrew here. Perfect. And then that comes off. And then you can use a debakey if you want just to hold the straw. Uh, and that all comes through. And then you can play with how you want the straw to be. I like it to be right there. Uh, and then you can let the leads kind of fall the way you want, just depending. Remember I made that plane in this orientation? So we can do that and just make sure. Oh, now they want to flip around. That's okay. You let them do what they want to do. And you make sure you can see the, the leads coming out here. I'm trying to maintain the anchors as they were, but there we go. I'm starting to see them. Perfect. Great. So that's all good. And then I connect to my IPG. And I can just show you guys. I don't want to dirty up your demos too badly. But uh, with the Infineon, because there's 16 electrodes, we would use splitters. And the cool thing about this spec uh, WaveRider uh, Alpha is that you have uh, four eights. So you can see the four ports. I'll, I'll do that camera. Uh, there you go. You can see the four ports, uh, eight electrodes each, eight contacts each. Uh, and then you'd use a splitter to go into each one. You can also use the CX lead, uh, which allows uh, you to not have to add on additional equipment uh, for MRI conditionality, et cetera. So you have 16 electrodes. And then you have the two splits here, uh, which is a really cool thing. You do have to use a specialized needle for this. But these options are, are awesome, depending on what you need from your patients. Um, the FAST algorithm with Boston Scientific allows for faster programming. Uh, they're doing a lot of great work out of Duke University with Dr. Warren Grills, looking at uh, what, what different frequencies, how do we get to relief as soon as possible to understand uh, what's best for the patient. Um, as I've mentioned already uh, briefly with Medtronic, they have their uh, IPG that's rechargeable. It's, a, it's, a small, it's the smallest IPG in the market. It's called Intellis. Uh, one of the cool things they've done is invest in a DTM. Great outcomes. But if you look at the outcomes in all the spinal cord stimulation companies, guys, as you can see in the last few years, ever since the Senza RCT in 2015, everyone is seeing great reductions in pain. The entire industry is better. Uh, and so really, it's our job to help educate our, our fellow physicians that are non-interventional, the primary care providers, uh, even the APPs, and all of the ancillary staff, physical therapists, et cetera, who are, who are understanding what these kind of therapies can do for patients. Because if you go back 20 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, there were complications with this therapy. There were you know, a great deal of lead fractures, migrations, infections, et cetera. And not to say those complications don't exist today, but we're seeing a reduction over time. And I think a big part of that is not only the improvements in the technology itself, but also our education. So hopefully some of these tricks and tips have helped you uh, with your spinal cord stimulation implants in the future. Dr. David, I'll pass it back to you or Dr. Beal if you guys have any questions. That was spinal cord stim implant, 20 minutes. Pretty good. So let's open it up to questions and comments. Uh, Rama, I got a question. Uh, yeah, Brian. So uh, you didn't, uh, I mean, it's real slick how you did it. I love, I love how you did that. But uh, maybe you can kind of discuss a little bit about how you, you went in on one side. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat approach. It's a neat technique to be able to do. And, and some people go in on opposite sides, but maybe what your, your thinking is on, do you always go in on one side and, and maybe why you do it? Yeah, so I always do go on one side. And, and as I mentioned, we were trained to come in from both sides. And um, you know, I think the idea there was, well, you know, the, the epidural space is, you know, finite and, and we, we, you can do the right lead on one side, the left lead on the other side, but there's, there's really no rhyme or reason for that. The interlaminar space is actually quite large. You can I've put in a lot of different needles in the same interlaminar space for different types of therapies. Um, and I remember my fellows at UCSF going, what the heck? I mean, back in the day, I was doing four uh, eight contact leads, and I had four needles in one interlaminar space. And, and the truth is, it, you can do that. That's not a big deal. 
so coming in from the same side really isn't a novel idea, in my opinion. I mean, it's something I've, I've sort of adapted to doing. Um, and is, what's most important is where you end up in the interlaminar space. So if you want a right-sided lead, you know, make it at midline or just right of midline. If you want a left-sided lead, make it at midline or just left of midline. Um, if there's a crossover, if it's coming in from the left side and go to the right, that's not a huge deal. The only concern there is if it pulls down, it might cross over the midline so it stops being a right-sided lead and becomes more of a left-sided lead. So as long as you're, as you're traveling up, you're up that right side, as you're traveling up, you're up that left side, if there is any movement or migration, at least it's gonna stay in those channels. That's what's really important for the programmers who are gonna work with the patients in the next several years. Okay, any further questions, comments? Well, Doug and, and, and Rama, do you want you guys to comment on uh, the two different technologies that are presented here, which is Medtronic and Boston Scientific, and your guys' thoughts uh, and upon the waveforms and the technology of both. Well, go ahead. You know, for uh, different systems and different waveforms, we have, you know, tonic, we have feedback systems, we have high frequency, and I think most of this, uh, in the future, what I view is maybe the best solution is to have everything in one can. One box it will do a little bit of everything. So as we mentioned, some of the therapies are very successful over the course of a year to two years to three years. It wanes, whether it be neuro accommodation, tachyphylaxis, whatever you want to use as a descriptor, descriptor for this, uh, it kind of wanes over time. And I think maybe it's necessarily the ability to change and uh, to combat that neural accommodation, to change waveforms, to have feedback systems that keeps everything, the, the system uh, uh, power at whatever you can maintain uh, internally by positional movements and to be able to change these waveforms over time to make sure to combat the accommodation that the, that the spinal cord and, and our uh, nervous system will have. So I think in the future, maybe lots of different waveform capabilities, the ability to change it over time, and the ability to use whatever is necessary as a feedback to help propagate the system per the specific patient's activity. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Doug. I, I think that, uh, firstly, I wanted to say all these companies have done a really good job for a space in making these therapies better. As I mentioned, if you look at all of the RCTs for all of the different companies that are the, the major companies, they all have phenomenal outcomes with you know, responder rates of 70 to 85%, with DTM having 84% responder rate. It's fantastic. Where we're going in the future, as you just mentioned, feedback, having physiologic uh, parameters that help guide how these therapies work. Uh, the Saluda is now in the market. Uh, it's commercial, just of, as of last month. And I think what that's going to do is really change the game for everybody to catch up and, and do the same things. I know Medtronic, for example, has their system of feedback as well, and I know all the companies will do that. But we're going even further than that because it's, it's really about what we've learned from the, the COVID pandemic in that uh, patients want digital solutions, and they want these answers to be passive and not active. So the next company coming to market will, will I think, uh, answer some of those questions. Um, and I think the rest of the industry is going to change too. And they're going to understand that your iPhone, your Apple Watch, your Google Health are all going to be communicating with your IPG or CAN to help guide how these therapies work and to understand the outcomes. How much more is our patient walking? How much better is that patient's sleep? Uh, do we alter the therapies because of that? Are the ECAPs showing this? Um, so this is really, if you're not doing spinal cord simulation, this is like the time to get it. It's super exciting. Uh, because we're now looking at it beyond pain. We're looking at it as really like a health monitor uh, from, from hour to hour, day to day. Awesome. Well, with that, we'll take a short break. We're going to visit the exhibit.